Social media for churches. Maybe you find yourself in a role at your church that you're not formally trained in. Maybe you were given the responsibility because you are younger. Or maybe your efforts on social media are now under what feels like a microscope because a global pandemic has put massive amounts of pressure on what our churches post online because there's very little else to rely on. This is where a formalized social policy and strategy is going to be your best friend. So what you're about to learn is a set of seven guidelines and procedures that will define and direct your church's efforts on social. It's gonna help with decision-making, it'll help with personal relationships at your church as different ministry leaders tell you they need a post for this and a post for that. And it's gonna help set you and your church on an upward trajectory on social with the express purpose of affecting life change. And stick around until the end of the video because I'll be sharing with you a written policy template that you can download, customize, and formalize at your church. Let's dive in. Well, hey there, I'm Brady Shearer. This is Pro Church Tools, and we're here to help your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. If you're new here, I'd love it if you would subscribe. If you've already subscribed, I'd love it if you turn on notifications. And no matter who you are, if you think this video is deserving of a like, please do not withhold that like. Just click the thumbs up button. And if your church is ready to take its next big leap, that's what we built Nucleus for the next generation of church software dedicated to seeing more next steps and life change at your church. With Nucleus, your church gets a modern website builder, sermon engine, giving platform, social media library, and unlimited stock footage. Thousands of churches use Nucleus, and you can get started for free with no credit card required. Just head to nucleus.church to start your 30-day free trial. Again, that link is nucleus.church, and you'll also find it in the description below. Okay, so there are seven rules in this church social policy and strategy template, but this is actually the third video in a series that we've been doing on church-wide communications. And really, there are two camps of people that I'm speaking to right now. Number one, since the beginning of the pandemic, you've been given new responsibilities that revolve around social, digital, online, communications, etc., and you're a little bit new to this. And then the other camp of folks is you were already doing some of this stuff prior to the pandemic, but now there's a spotlight on your work and ministry like never before. And maybe you feel your system starting to buckle a little bit underneath that weight. Because I don't know about you, but I was not formally trained in this. You, know, you figure it out as you go. You learn by doing. And in a digital world that changes so quickly, that's really the only way to learn it. But here's the good news. What you're about to learn in these seven rules will serve you for years to come. This strategy isn't reliant on the latest trends or the newest social platforms. It will help you navigate those things though, but it won't need to be rewritten every time a social shift occurs and they will occur. And like I said, this is part of a series. The first video is called The New Rules for Church Growth in a Post-Pandemic World. That video is gonna teach you how to reliably and accurately track your church's growth and health. The second video is called Seven Rules for Church Communication Strategy. And that video gives you a policy template for church-wide comms. And now we're ready to laser in on social media specifically. But if you haven't watched those first two videos, I highly suggest it because there's a lot of foundational knowledge taught in those that we're carrying over into this video. And think of these strategies like building blocks, one on top of the other. They all work together in harmony. So if you're missing a piece, the whole structure becomes that much more vulnerable. And both of those videos are linked in the description below. Okay, I do apologize. This is a lengthy preamble, though I do feel it's necessary. But enough of it. We're ready for rule number one. Rule number one, our efforts on social must be informed by Christ. So let's ask ourselves this question. What does the Bible say about social media? And should churches be using social at all in the first place? You know, maybe you've faced resistance in the past from senior leadership because they're uncertain on how social aligns with the mission of a church. Or maybe you've never really thought about this at length and your church is active online just because, well, look, the whole world is active online. Either way, I think this is an important place to begin. And for me, it starts with the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. So the mandate here is that we need to be where the people are. And social checks that box. Here's a graph that charts social media usage amongst American adults. In 2005, just 5% of the public was using at least one social platform. 
By 2011, that had risen to 50%. And now in a recent pre-pandemic number, we're at almost three out of every four adults. Moreover, as social media usage has grown, it's also become more broadly representative of the greater population overall. You know, like most cultural shifts, it starts with the young people, but now is widely used across different ages, income demographics, education levels, race, gender, you name it. Lastly, but also tremendously important, not only are most of us active on social, we are frequently active. In fact, across each of the major social platforms, the majority of users are checking in at least once every day. And this shows no signs of stopping. You think Gen Z, the TikTok generation, currently in high school and college is going to be less involved in the digital media landscape than my generation, the millennials? I would say that's a poor prediction. Platforms will shift, mature, and evolve. Yes, but digital and social are here to stay. So to go back to the Great Commission, it starts with a verb, go. Don't keep your faith and the good news and the way of Christ to yourself, but share it with the world. Go where the people are. And in the scope of human history, we have never seen anything like social media when it comes to attention and scale. So then the follow-up question should really be, well, how should we be using social? So again, let's look to Jesus because what I see is that when Jesus spoke, he used worldly ideas accessible to the common person to talk about the kingdom of God. So for example, he'd talk about agriculture, farming, baking, economics, labor, wine, sheep, borrowing from the everyday experiences of the culture at that time, and then using those as springboards to teach about the kingdom of God. So the idea here is simple. Find the intersection between faith and culture. Where can the good news cross paths with the lived experiences of the person you're trying to reach? Use Jesus as your example, and then go and do likewise. Let's move to rule number two. Use social media to do ministry, not just promote ministry. Here's the crux of the problem. The North American church is so invested in programming that we exist in a place where we've come to conflate attendance with mission. We see increased attendance as greater fulfillment of mission. But the mission of our churches and the reason we exist is to affect life change. So really, attendance should be at most an ancillary barometer for us. And we go into this in greater depth in that other video that I mentioned, the new rules for church growth in a post-pandemic world. And it really is required watching here because until you shift the method for how your church quantifies fulfillment of mission away from attendance and replace that with what we call next steps, you're always gonna find yourself in a place where you feel compelled to use comms and social to promote ministry rather than do ministry. So allow me to show you a real example of this. Let's say that prayer is a strong value at your church. What most of our churches do in this case is we whip up a social post promoting an upcoming prayer event at our church. The thinking here is that people are online scrolling through their social feeds. Let's make them aware of an in-person gathering that we have coming up where we'd love to have them join us in prayer. To manage social properly though, your first impulse should be to do ministry on social rather than promote ministry. So instead of inviting people in your church to pray soon, why not invite them to pray now? So that's where a countdown prayer post like this one is useful. Because people are already on their phones, mindlessly scrolling through their feeds, let's invite them to make better use of that time and stop scrolling right now and begin to pray right now. And this is what it looks like to use social to do ministry rather than promote ministry. And while it might feel a bit foreign at first, just because it's not our default proclivity, once you've established it as a pillar in your church's social policy, I'm confident you'll be able to start thinking creatively here. Because yes, it sure is easy to use social to promote, but it's not effective. And side note here, balancing promotion and doing it the right way is generally the biggest struggle churches have on social. So that's why we did an entire video on church comms policy as a whole. And that video is focused on promotion, how to do it correctly and in a way where your church will actually respond. So that's linked in the description part two of this series. Make sure to give it a watch. Rule number three, find a sustainable pace for your church. Here's the key to success on social. Ready? You listening? Post high quality content consistently for 10 years. Got it? Now, why 10 years? I don't know, It's because it's a long time. And if you think about the origins of social, the foundation is human connection, relationships. And building relationships takes a really long time, especially if you want them to count for something. And for the sake of brevity here, I'm gonna do something I don't normally do in a video and just share with you a handful of Instagram posts of mine that I think sum up this rule perfectly and succinctly. Let's start with this one. 
Social media is like exercise. One amazing post won't accomplish much, nor will one workout. The key to progress is sustained effort over the long term. Don't get distracted by the specifics, especially at the start. Instead, find your sustainable pace and stick to it. And what's great about this rule is that it informs how many platforms your church chooses to publish to and how frequently you post as well. So like I say in this post, just because a platform exists does not mean you need to be on it. So here's how to balance multiple platforms for your church. Pick one where the most people in your church are active. Generate momentum on that platform. Ensure you found a sustainable pace that you can keep up for years to come and then consider expanding to a second platform and then repeat. To that end, I know very few online creators that excel on multiple platforms. To do it well, you need a team. Best to choose one platform first and invest all your energy there versus splitting your energy across multiple platforms. Don't look to that visible church that you see everywhere online and assume that what they do applies to you. Firstly, that church has multiple creators likely making it all happen. And secondly, that church is also likely driven by a charismatic personality, which is something I wouldn't recommend aspiring to. If it comes organically, that's a different story. And this rule should also be used to inform your posting volume and frequency because you don't need to post every day on social. Platforms are too saturated nowadays to give anything less than your best. Throwaway posts may fill a quota, but they'll punish your long-term effectiveness. So here's what you need to do. Get a sense for your current pace on social and ask yourself, is this sustainable for the next 10 years? Or does our current pace spell inevitable burnout? Because if it's the latter, here's what you need to do. Immediately start posting less frequently and prioritize quality over quantity. And secondly, you might need to pull back on the number of pages and platforms you're posting to. Practically, here's what you can do on this front. Don't delete your account, keep it active, but instead use it as a redirect to the accounts that you are active on. So as an example, if you search for at Pro Church Tools on Instagram, here's what you'll find. A neat little grid and in the description, a clear point to the Instagram account that I have that is actually active. The one with my name, at Brady Shearer. This is the account that we use for all of our Pro Church Tools content because we still haven't reached a point even with a team of about 20 at our company where I think we can handle multiple Instagram accounts and do them both well. Hopefully we can get there, but we're not there yet, and that's okay. Also, all of the posts that you've seen here came from my Instagram, at Brady Shearer. This is the best place to connect with me personally, and it's also where I'm posting my most timely content, so if you aren't already following, please do. Rule number four, reach publicly, connect personally. You have two responsibilities as the social media creator or director at your church. Reach publicly, connect personally. And every single thing you do should be fulfilling one of those two aims. And if you aren't doing both of these things, your church's social presence will always be incomplete. So I'll say it again, reach publicly, connect personally. Now, most of our churches understand the reach publicly part of social. That means publishing posts on your pages and profiles that are public and can be seen by the world. And the reason most of us understand this is because this is the part of social that is visible, so we can follow the cues of what others are doing online because we can see all of it. The connect personally part is where we often struggle. But here's what you need to know. The organizations and individuals that are building vibrant online communities are doing so by connecting personally behind the scenes. That means direct messages, email, chat, and the like. And this might surprise you, but I spend considerably more time on social connecting personally than I do reaching publicly. We get hundreds of messages and DMs every single week, and we put in the work to get back to every single one of them. Because we know that by connecting personally, we can create meaningful points of contact with people that will last. Here's what's also interesting. If you had to define how the world uses social, it could be summed up in these two stanzas. We reach publicly, we connect personally. And often we see dramatic variations in how different generations balance these. As an example, generally, those that are older will drift to the reach publicly side while those that are younger will drift to the connect personally side. I'll use my younger cousins as an example. I'm about 10 years their senior. I follow them on Instagram and they post to their feed and stories every so often. And yet, when I'm with them at family gatherings, they talk about using social nonstop. And that's because they're connecting personally with their friends in the DMs, the type of stuff that will never be seen publicly. And this is why your social media responsibilities must include both, reach publicly, connect, personally, because if you're missing one, you'll likely be missing out on an entire age demo. And this is why I'm not surprised when churches come to me and say, yeah, we're just not really reaching the younger people in our church on social, even though we're active on Insta. 
It's because their strategy is almost always focused primarily on reaching publicly, overlooking the connecting personally element, which is what younger people do almost exclusively online. Reach publicly, connect personally. Your two responsibilities on social. Rule number five, stop the scroll. Think about it this way. You are sharing the greatest story of all time, the message of Jesus, but it doesn't matter how amazing your message is if no one's listening, right? And this is why every smart social strategy needs these three words, stop the scroll. Now, why is stop the scroll so important? Well, because that's how you and I use social. We open up our phones, we take our thumb and we flick, 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 we scroll, scroll, scroll. And so if you wanna get someone's attention, you first need them to stop scrolling. Now, when it comes to specific techniques for stopping the scroll on social, those are often going to be tied into the latest design trends, which may or may not be relevant to you depending on when you're watching this. But one of the best ways to stop the scroll, which transcends any social or design trend, is to use photos of people in your social posts. Not stock photos of people, mind you, but real people that are connected to your church. And again, this is a timeless technique and it makes a huge difference because we as humans are a social species. We connect with other humans on an instinctual level. And to make a point, a few years ago, Georgia Institute of Technology and Yahoo Labs researchers looked at 1.1 million photos on Instagram and they found that pictures with human faces were 38% more likely to receive likes than pictures with no faces and 32% more likely to attract comments. Stop the scroll. And then once you've stopped the scroll, you have the opportunity to share the good news with someone, but you gotta get them to stop scrolling first. All right, let's keep making progress here. Keep fleshing out our policy templates. Stay with me, all right? I know this is going long. It's gonna be worth it. Rule number six, repeat the best, forget the rest. Here's a social media secret you won't hear very often. Ready? Nobody knows what they're doing, nobody. Okay, talk to any person that you look up to online and they'll tell you of the countless times they published something, they were sure it was gonna be a hit, and then it falls flat. Inversely, they'll probably tell you that some of their most popular posts were pieces they thought were subpar and they never could have envisioned them taking off the way they did. This is because social media is tremendously difficult. It's a combination of copywriting, photography, graphic design, videography, communications, customer support, branding, storytelling, theology, all rolled into one. It ain't easy. Here's the good news though. Social does a great job of showing you in great depth how your audience is responding to your posts. So this is where rule number six comes from. Repeat the best, forget the rest. When you stumble upon a post type that resonates with your audience, go back to it again and again and again and keep pulling from that well until it goes dry. For example, if you see great engagement on quote posts, give them a permanent spot in your social calendar. On the other hand, if you keep posting quotes and you don't see them really resonating, don't keep forcing it. Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. Repeat the best, forget the rest. Now you might be wondering, well, what constitutes good engagement versus bad anyway? And this is highly individual. You should be comparing your posts against your posts, not one of your posts versus a similar post from a different church. And a simple equation that you can use is engagement divided by reach. So count up all of your likes, comments, shares, saves, etc., and divide that total number by reach, the number of people who actually saw that post. And then do that for each of the posts that you've published on social for a given platform in the last 90 days and see what your top performers are. And for Instagram, you can actually just go to your insights tab and see what content has performed the best. Search by date, rank by metric, see what's rising above the rest and do more of that. Repeat the best, forget the rest. Now, one more thing I'll say on this rule, it's also still important to experiment with different post types. So perhaps a better way of phrasing this rule would be repeat the best, forget the rest, and continue to experiment with post types you've never tried before. It just doesn't have the same ring to it. But here's why this is important. There's a post type that exists out there that your audience would love, but you just haven't experimented with it yet. And if you aren't willing to experiment, you'll never discover that post. This gets back to my original point that none of us know what we're doing, but those who do succeed on social are able to trust this process. Repeat the best, forget the rest, never stop experimenting. Finally, rule number seven, offline and online ministry must work together as allies, not adversaries. Now, I haven't addressed this at all yet. I've saved it until now, but there will be people that watch this video that think to themselves, you know what? Social cannot replace in-person gatherings. 
Said differently, what we do online can never replace what we do offline, to which I would say, that's correct. I fully agree with you. But here's what I'll also say. What we do offline can never replace what we do online. And listen, you might balk at that claim. In fact, I expect many of you to. So let me frame it to you this way. Digital and social as constructs in culture are still relatively new, very new in fact. Facebook is really just in its adolescence right now as a platform that's been around for 10 to 15 years. So fast forward in your mind with me right now and think of our youngest generation, Gen Z. And now imagine them as adults and think about what the world could look like then. And now imagine an individual from Gen Z leading a church. Do you think they'll be having board meetings and group discussions where they'll be talking and debating about the merits of digital? where they'll quibble back and forth on what we should be doing about social and if it's worth our time? Of course not, because it's gonna be so ingrained into culture and into the everyday life of the public that that type of conversation wouldn't even be something to consider. It would never even come up. So that's the direction we're heading. And we're heading there fast because this global pandemic is serving as an accelerator. The trends that we were already seeing, well, we're just seeing them even faster. And depending on your church's demographic, you might be in that tricky position where you've got one foot in both camps. And I'll be the first to acknowledge how tough this can be because many of our churches skew older. And so it's our responsibility to care for those in our family right now, while at the same time not neglecting where we're very clearly heading. And this generational gap is real. The communication shift is real. It's difficult to navigate. That's why I'm always saying we're living through the biggest communication shift in 500 years, the biggest since the printing press. So let's go back to rule number seven. Here's how I like to think of it. Your week has 168 hours, and maybe one of those hours is dedicated to an in-person service on average. That still leaves 167 hours beyond that where you won't be meeting in person with your church, but you can still connect with them online. And if we wish to thrive as churches in the coming decades, online and offline ministry need to be working together as partners in lockstep, harmoniously supporting the other, not cannibalizing the other. Because the mission of our churches is not to host a service, nor is it to post on social media. The mission of our churches is to affect life change. And both offline and online ministry each have a unique role in making that happen. Now, you may have noticed that we didn't give too many post examples in this video. This video was very philosophical, very strategic. But now you have the policy template to actually make those posting decisions wisely. To that end, if you wanna see a video of similar depth on post ideas for churches that align with these rules, give this video a thumbs up and consider that a vote for that kind of future video. If enough people want it, I'll make it. Also, in the description below, you'll find a link to a written version of this social media strategy and policy template that you can copy, customize, and formalize at your church, so make sure to take advantage of that. Again, link is in the description below, and if you made it this far, you're a hero. Please comment below and let me know your biggest takeaway. Which of these rules created the biggest light bulb moment for you? And let me know by commenting below. Thanks again for your time. Subscribe, turn on notifications. I'll talk to you real soon. Bye.